Good morning, everybody. How are you today? Low cloud, lovely photography weather. I've done a bit of beeping and creeping to get out on the road. I'm going the fast way today because I'm a bit late. I've got a substitute memory card in the camera because I keep, when I offload the footage, I keep leaving the chip at work. So I've now got two chips. I've taken the chip out of my wildlife camera so I can swap the two chips around or more likely leave both at work. Let's try and get a bit of warm air everywhere. Fat chance of that. So, how are you? All right? Don't look, scarf. Three degrees outside now. Bit of a contrast, isn't it, to those lovely videos I've been uh, uploading of June 2018 and all that. You see that car coming around the bend there? That on that bend, you have to keep over to the left. Whichever way you're coming round, because there's a high chance of collision if you don't keep well over. Because if by the time you see a car coming the other way, it's too late. This is the puddle that never used to exist until they planted trees all over that field on the right. And now the runoff, the water runs off into the road and makes a lake. And if you rewind the footage, you'll see that they put a curb in and a drain in the council, and it made no difference whatsoever. I can only imagine it's completely full of mud and earth. It's silted up straight away. So there we are. There's, a, there's your centralised uh, solutions for you. Another one here, look. This is why I don't come. If it's been raining a lot, and it has been raining a lot lately, this is why I don't come this way. We've still got a water shortage here. There's still a ban on hose pipes, believe it or not. So, what's up, what's up? My friend who moved to Japan has now got a three-year spouse's visa so he's staying he's living with his wife in japan so that's a shame because he's uh was my only friend i'm not gonna try always out in front of these cars this isn't exactly the junction of death but it's the junction of severe injury if you get things wrong There we go. We're in the flow. So what's uh, you know I know I just know, what's going on with you? <laughs> you never ring. You never call. <laughs> yeah. I've just got a normal week as far as I know. Fitted a lot of Maryland bridges lately. I'm liking the Maryland bridges. The patients are liking the Maryland bridges. Very little preparation involved. Um, you know, you have to have a decent lab. They have to prepare the wings properly. Ideally, ideally, really, you want them uh, sandblasted and then etched with something like hydrofluoric acid. But they don't do the fluoric acid thing anymore. They just sandblast them, I think. Um, and then you have to put them on with uh, the right glue, which is Panavia X. PX. Don't use any other glue. And Panavia X is a weird glue. I mean, because I've been uh, in the profession so long, I've tried, I qualified when I was. 22 i'm 63 now so I've 41 years in the profession and so i've seen quite a few things that modern dentists take for granted i've seen them invented so uh you know i mean almost composite composite was just coming onto the market when i qualified uh, before that it was silica cement and uh, uh certainly uh, all things light cured all things uh ultrasonic Apex locators and Panavia was um, 
a special glue design for cementing Maryland bridges. And it's got a few really sort of weird characteristics. Uh, and I'm liking it more and more. Um, <coughs> first of all, because it's Japanese. And in my experience, Japanese materials are the dog's bollocks in terms of strength and what they do. And um, also, when you mix it, it's got two weird things. One is it, it's pink. And the other weird thing is it's... Um, uh, it won't set if it's exposed to oxygen. So the correct technique is to, um, you can mix it like a five minutes or so in advance, but you have to leave it smeared very thinly across the mixing pad. And it sits there. And um, then what you do is you get the uh, tooth etched, make sure it's really, you know, properly etched and isolated, or the bridge or whatever you're sticking on. And then you, um, it's got a two uh, little uh, pots or something which you mix together to bond, which you paint on the bridge and you also paint on the prep. And uh, air thin those, but don't cure them. And then you, with a flat plastic, drag up some of this pink, it's almost like liquid stuff, dob it on the bridge and then um, unseat the bridge in. Now, the critical thing is obviously, you have to seat the bridge accurately. Now, my lab uh, puts little hooks, little claws over the incisal angles of my Maryland's to make sure that I fit them in properly. And, and I'm not sure I like that because it does involve quite a lot of drilling after the event to get these little hooks off. And, and I really don't like drilling a, you know, like a freshly bonded crown. It's like, I mean, you know, it's bad enough with the patients biting on it and me checking the bite and uh, without, um, you know, ultrasonic vibrations from the drill. So I might have a word with them because actually, I mean, I, I can be trusted to put the thing on in the right place uh, without the hooks. But um, the trick is, what you do is that... <clears throat> Providing the tooth is very clean and dry, then you can try these Maryland bridges in beforehand. The problem is, it, it, like if uh, one of the pontics is a mo, uh, one of the abutments is a is a full coverage, then you might get some blood inside the you know etched etched surface of the bridge, and you don't really want these bridges contaminated. So you have to make sure that you don't contaminate them. But um, when you uh, dry them in, they should locate in pretty pretty firmly, even if the only thing that's locating them, let's say, is the palatal surface of a canine. You can still, I mean, they should, the undulations of the prep and the undulations of the, of the uh, wing should, should fit together so pretty precisely that there should be no doubt at all about how it goes in. And then once you've loaded it up with um, cement, then the next thing you do is um, you put it in and you pretty quickly... Uh, locate it into the correct position. You know, I would get this done. I'll get that done in a few seconds or so. You have got some time, but really you need to do that pretty quickly because this glue is going to set and you don't want the uh, bridge to be in the wrong position when it sets. And the way I do that is I, I put the bridge in and I plunk my finger underneath the wing and I wiggle the bridge about until my I can feel that it's, it's located correctly. And then basically, I just keep my finger on it for about five seconds. And the, the exclusion of the air, plus the uh, contact with the uh, bonding agent, is usually enough to uh, make the glue go off pretty quickly. Now, the lovely thing about Panera VRX is the bit that's the glue that's underneath the bridge sets, and the bit that's around the outside of the bridge does not set. So it's still running. So you can have this situation where you've got the, the bridge is pretty well held in place and you've still got your th finger underneath it. And then with your finger, you can just remove any excess glue from around the wing. If, and if you don't want to use your finger, you can use a brush, you know, a small brush.
Uh, and you've got about sort of 10, 15 seconds to do that. But then the stuff around the outside sort of starts to go off as well. So then by then it's a little bit late. It's much neater if you can do it really quickly. So it's good to have a nurse who's got everything ready, you know. She's got the uh, suction ready. She's got the, she's keeping an eye on to make sure everything stays dry. And at the same time, uh, she's got brushes to hand so that you can brush away any excess. Then it never used to be dual cure, I don't think, Panavera, because it used to be white, I think. And then, then when they, since it's gone pink, it's sort of now uh, light cured as well. But honestly, I don't really bother about light curing it because it, it's dual cure anyway. Um, the other thing that you can do is um, uh, they say that um, you know there might be uh, some residual uncured. Uh, glue resin uh, at the borders at the margins um, because where it's in contact with the oxygen it won't set and so they give you some uh, blue gel which is basically Vaseline to uh, just rub over the rub over the whole job to try and exclude any air you know so that the edges set but I should imagine you can also do that with a with a light curing unit uh, and the other thing that you can do with the modern light curing units, especially now that they're such high power, is uh, you can actually cure the glue through the tooth. So let's say you're you're bonding onto a wing on an upper right three. Um, you can put the light on the to the labial of the upper right three and illuminate the entire tooth. And believe me, some of that light is going to get through to the blatal surface and and cure the, uh, the, the bond, you know, the bond, the uh, cure the glue directly. Um, and like I say, because it's Japanese and it's a bit manic, it's all very, uh, it's all very good. Now, if, uh, if one of these things <coughs> debonds, then can be a bit of a nuisance because occasionally I have seen others dentist jobs deep on and if the let's say it's on a five and a three and the five full coverage then that will probably support the bridge even though the three is debonded and then you end up with decay underneath the three uh, abutment wing which is a nuisance uh, and you know it can be quite extensive if it's not been spotted early um, <clears throat> But, you know, that's pretty rare. And of course, if the patient's having regular checkups and, and the wing is debonded, then you should, usually you should be able to see that because, I mean, these wings are pretty tight. And if you even suspect there's a debond, um, you can very gently just introduce a probe underneath the edge of the wing and if and you'll, and it'll, it'll twist, you know, the, the wing will come off a half a millimetre or so um, if it's debonded. And um, usually what happens is after a while, the wing and the tooth it's bonded to can move apart slightly, just very slightly, but enough to be detectable. So um, just keep an eye out for that. And the other thing is that when you're doing uh, distal wings, uh, low round sixes and stuff like that, then uh, what I do is I do a classic, uh, I do always do a D rest. So like, for example, if I'm doing, if I'm replacing a five, and I'm uh, doing two wings onto the six and the four, then what I'll do is I'll obviously put wings, you know, um, immediately on the four, distally on the six, but then I'll also cut little um, rests adjacent to the pontic, uh, little D rests, D shaped rests to um, a recessed into the tooth. But you have to say to the patient, look, you know, we, we, I've got this sort of claw arrangement going on here where the we're trying to prevent shearing force on the wings, which is the worst type of force uh, for a wing. I mean, they don't mind uh, compression or uh, whatever the opposite of compression is, but uh, tension, but they don't like shear. And uh, when you're biting, let's say you're biting on a five, if you haven't put those rests in, then 
all that force on the five is being transmitted to the wings through in a in, through a shear force. Time to get fleeced again by the by the Qataris. <laughs> Time to contribute to the World Cup stadium. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so what happens is that these um, D rests absorb the uh, the force in compression from the bite, which is the shear force on the wings, and then in return, the um, also they they prevent the uh, wings moving in a way away from the tooth you know in a in a way that they would if they were under tension so to cut a long story short the d-shaped rests keep the wings on and the wings keep the d-shaped rests seated properly but you have to say to the um, patient it's going to look like you've got two tiny little silver fillings either side of this false tooth and they're the d-rests and they're absolutely necessary to hold this thing in you know, it's all part of the whole um Part, part of the whole complex that keeps keeps the thing attached and they do stay attached they will stay attached uh, you know but again also a lot of the times i say to the patients you know look this is an adhesive bridge and basically it's only as good as the adhesive now we import our adhesive we have it it's flown halfway across the world from japan it's the best adhesive in the world as far as i know that's you know it's that's why we use it there's no better um but with all bonded dentistry bonded dentistry only has two states bonded or not bonded and uh, so that's why if they fail they're going to fail usually they fail quickly um, and if they haven't failed after a week or two then chances are they are not going to fail but you know that is they're not indestructible. That's what we're saying. They're not indestructible. So, you know, just be sensible. After a while, you forget they're in there. You don't notice the wings. They just become part of your mouth. You don't even notice them. Um, nowadays, you know, since I had that crown fitted and it was a bit weird on my bite, and yet now everything seems fine i always tell the patients that the teeth move around and uh, will sort themselves out after a week or so although i'm not saying that you can be grossly wrong incorrect on the bite but you know i wouldn't i wouldn't ponce about trying to mi micromanage the bite really on something that is fundamentally okay just because the patient says oh, no, no, i can feel it i can feel it I should tell them, yeah, you'll feel it for about two weeks. And then one morning you'll wake up and you realize that you haven't felt anything for a week. The teeth, they sort themselves out. I personally have got a lower right seven gold crown, which is far too high, buckley, far too high. The reason it was far too high was because it was uh, not filed down enough, being at the back. He's a cheeky bastard, isn't he? Can't be bothered to go round the roundabout. So, <laughs> yeah, so what happened was they then put the gold crown on top. So then it went, came back to the dentist and he tried it on and asked me to fit my teeth together and there was absolutely no, I was about an, out, an inch open at the front. And so what did he do? What he didn't, oh, he didn't want to do what, you know, other dentists might have done, which is either send the crown back, get me numb again, reduce the prep, or grind the hell out of the crown and make a hole in it, which he knew that I would notice because I'm a dentist. So he ground the hell out of my uh, buckle cusps on my upper right seven. Hey presto, tooth, mouth shuts. But, um, you know, job done except that you know when you're you're dealing with someone who's very dentally aware who's obviously very dentally aware because they're a dentist they're going to realize aren't they they're going to realize that the cusps on the seven are a, a millimeter above all the other cusps in the row they're going to realize that the cusp on the upper right seven is uh has been ground off ground uh, the buggery ground out of it and it will, will eventually fracture which is exactly what's happened 
And what's happened is that where I've had to have the MOD redone on the on the seven on the top right, it's um. Hello, it's Mrs. Eight Forty Five. You know, and they've had to reproduce that fault by, re by reproducing it, by redoing the fact that it's too low. As you can see, got a rush. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye.